Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Leanne Darcy, and I'm Alatra Conservation Trust's Outreach Coordinator. With me, I have Emma Olmos, ACT's Conservation Events Coordinator, Erica Hernandez, ACT's Conservation Director, Daniel Catazone, a USGS biologist, and Janice Becker, a Volunteer Coordinator for, Florida, for Florida's Department of Environmental Protection's Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection at the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve. As a bit of background, ACT's mission is to protect the natural, scenic, historic, and recreational resources in and around North Central Florida. ACT protects lands through acquisition, donation, and conservation easements in 16 counties. Tonight's presentation is part of ACT's Keep Florida Wild virtual series. If you would like to support future environmental educational programming like tonight's talk, a donation can be made by texting Florida Wild to 44321. We appreciate your support. A recording of tonight's talk will be available online following the event on ACT's YouTube page. There will also be a Q&A following tonight's presentation. Please submit your questions at any time in the chat or through the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce tonight's panelists for the evening. First to speak will be Daniel Cadazone. Dan received his bachelor's in wildlife conservation biology from the University of Rhode Island and a master's in interdisciplinary ecology from the University of Florida. Dan is currently a USGS biologist studying sea turtles and diamondback terrapins in the Florida Panhandle. After Dan, we'll hear from Janice Becker. Before she joined the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve in 2014, Janice gained her expertise through her experiences working at the Georgia Aquarium Dolphin Research Center, the Gulf Specimen Marine Lab, the FWC Marine Turtle Program, and as a sea turtle lightning specialist from the University of Florida's IFAS. Last to present will be Emma Olmos. Emma is an Alachua County native who joined ACT after completing dual degrees in environmental and sustainability science and de developmental sociology at Cornell University. She specialized in water research management, education, and policy. Emma worked as an undergraduate research assistant where she assisted in soil and nutrient studies of restored uplands in the upstate New York area. Her favorite part of her work is engaging with the community and she is always ready to meet and chat with you in an event. She's passionate about ensuring that natural spaces are conserved, accessible, and equitable to the communities that depend on them today and into the future. Tonight, we'll also hear from Erica Hernandez, who'll be joining us during the Q&A portion of the evening. Erica joined ACT in the spring of 2019 after spending a year camping across the Western US and Canada. Erica has spent her career researching flora and fauna across the state of Florida and earned her master's in interdisciplinary ecology from the H.T. Odom Center for Wetlands at the University of Florida. Erica has been a public servant for state agencies and public universities for over 20 years, often collaborating for complex projects requiring large stakeholder participation. When not daydreaming, when not daydreaming about science, Erica can be found foraging for wild fruit or blacksmithing. Thank you to all of our presenters for joining us this evening. And with all that being said, let's hear from our first speaker, Dan Cadazon. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep my video off for the presentation just because I'm having some internet issues. So if you guys hear any or are having trouble hearing me, hear me, please let me know. All right, everyone. So I'm going to be talking today about some of the sea turtle research and monitoring that we do in Gulf County, Florida. Uh, decided to take a little bit different approach with this presentation. So lots of photos, not a lot of text. Uh, hope you like this layout. So what I first wanted to go over with you guys is some of the species that we work with. So one of the primary species that we work with is the loggerhead sea turtle, which is listed as threatened. Um, you can see over here on the right, uh, just some of the different um, items that these guys eat. Anything from crustaceans to bivalves, fish, algae, seagrass, gastropods, jellies. Uh, these are all things that loggerheads uh, might eat. They are considered generalists. For the loggerhead sea turtle, this is a species that we get the opportunity to work with through most of its life stages from the nesting, hatching, juveniles, and even with the adults. We also get the opportunity to work with the Kemp's Ridley. 
They are also uh, endangered and considered a generalist. And again, they eat many of the same things the loggerheads do, but these turtles are a little bit smaller at adult size. So they tend to eat some of the smaller um, food prey items that are available for them. And right off the bat, you can see some of the main differences. Um, loggerheads typically have this more yellow, orangish color about them, whereas the Chemist Ridleys tend to be more gray. Our final main species that we work with is the green sea turtle, also listened, listed as threatened. This is a generalized, uh, generalist and a specialist. Um, starting off at a younger age, they tend to be a little bit more generalist, and as they get over, older, they specialize. So you can see some of the same things that our other species eat, um, some of which they don't. We have those grayed out here, so they don't typically go after the fish, the gastropods, the tunicates. These are more of their main uh, food items. And as they get older, they tend to stick more towards these algae sea grasses. Then that's one of the reasons they do love St. Joe Bay and Gulf County because of our large extensive seagrass beds. So what kind of work are we doing? So just to give you all kind of, uh, if you're not familiar with Gulf County and St. Joe Bay, I have it laid out right here on this map with the little red star. I highlighted also Gainesville, Florida, to kind of situate anybody not familiar with the panhandle. It is about the central portion of the region. This is one of the main sites that we work in, and we do everything from our in-water research with juveniles to nesting work with adults and hatchlings. We do do a lot of our work throughout much of the northern Gulf, including other parts of the panhandle, as well as Alabama, Louisiana, and even Texas. <laughs> So one of the first things that we do is monitoring. So we have two beaches that we survey in Gulf County. One is the Air Force Base Beach, and I'll have a map later on that shows these, as well as uh, assisting the state park with their surveys as well. So every morning from May 1st through October 31st, we are going out every morning and we're looking for any signs of sea turtle nests. So we go out, we get primarily loggerhead sea turtles up in the northern Gulf, but we have um, relatively frequently in the past few years been getting green sea turtles more regularly. And on a very, very rare occasion, only once since I've worked here, uh, we've had the opportunity to have leatherback crawls. And we'll mark these nests, we monitor them for the entire time that they're incubating around 50 to 60 days, these nests typically start to hatch. And you get these cute little hatchlings that you see on the other side of the screen. The bottom um, picture right here is of a loggerhead sea turtle. And this top picture is a green sea turtle. You can see a little bit of differences up close. They're a lot easier to tell apart. Um, green sea turtles tend to be these little darker, whereas the loggerheads are brown. There are differences in the shapes. I didn't have a great picture of a side-by-side -side comparison, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea. You can also see even as the adults, there's differences in the types of tracks that they leave. And this allows us as we monitor them to record what species is actually nesting. And when we do find a nest, this is typically how our group will uh, mark the nests with some stakes, a number indicating which number nest of the season it is, flagging tape, kind of make it stand out a little bit more. And these yellow nest signs that are typical for most nests throughout the state, just indicating that this is a sea turtle nest and that you are not supposed to disturb it. On the research side of things, we also get the opportunity to work with the animals off the beach. So on this left picture of the loggerhead, you'll see this little metal tag and its flipper. We call these flipper tags. Um, these tags have a unique letter and number series that allows us to keep track of individuals. So we have some individuals, especially on the nesting beaches that we've been monitoring and keeping track of for over 20 years. And some of our more recent projects, especially on the in-water, we're able to keep track of these individuals, whether or not they leave St. Joseph Bay, Gulf County. Uh, there's a big database that sea turtle researchers across the state, the Gulf can report if these tags are seen and they're not their turtle. So it's a great project to figure out how long do these animals live? Where are they going? 
We also get the opportunity to not just do this through the tags, but also on the right, we have what are called satellite tags. You can see on the back of this turtle's shell, these satellite tags send out a signal to satellites and allow us to track the individuals uh, from the nesting beaches or for wherever, from wherever we tag them to different locations throughout the Gulf primarily. So this is just a map we have put together of turtles that we tagged in the 2020 season. These were all green sea turtles. Uh, these were all these turtles were tagged in Gulf County, but as you can see, um, ended up going into different places. So uh, flounder and stargazer, you can see their homes away from Gulf County were actually down in the Florida Keys. Scallop, we actually had go all the way to Mexico, which was the first green that we have tracked that far. So that was a pretty exciting uh, track for us. And coral and snapper, uh, those tracks, the tags unfortunately died early on them. So we don't think we got their full movement but we were able to track their movements for a few weeks through the nesting season. Now, this data is really important. Um, he says, as much as we love Gulf County and we love our turtles here, especially for sea turtles, you know, Gulf County is not their only home. And this just shows some of the wide range of areas that the turtles using our waters and our beaches are actually uh, using. We also are involved in stranding response. So this can be for dead or live turtles that uh, wash up on any of our beaches or in the bay. And we'll go out if it's uh, dead, we have a workup sheet where we can collect data that can be contributed to our overall knowledge of the species for the state. And if it's alive, we're able to get that animal to our local rehab facility. Over here, we work with one out of Panama City Beach called Gulf World. Here are these individuals I have pictured and our lovely volunteers that we get the opportunity to work with are helping during one of our cold stun events last year. So with all the research we're doing, I really like to highlight some of the outreach that goes on in Gulf County. So Gulf County, not a very large county, but we actually have five different groups that work uh, with sea turtles here in Gulf County. We are the primary research group that works in the county. And then we have three volunteer groups, the first being the Gulf and East Bay County Volunteer Group, the St. Joseph Peninsula Volunteer Group, and the Indian Pass Volunteer Group. All three of these groups are run by volunteers that take their time to monitor these beaches during the summer, just like we do monitor nests throughout the season and keep track of any nesting activity. St. Joseph Peninsula State Park, as I mentioned earlier, this top portion, number two, is run by the State Park Service, and we have the opportunity to assist them with their surveys. So this is a joint effort, and our primary site for nesting monitoring is down here in the green box on Eglin Air Force Base's Cape Sandblast property. Now with five groups, we are thankfully very close here in Gulf County and all work very closely together. A lot of our research, especially the work that we do with some of the nesting adult females takes place on the beaches that our volunteer groups monitor. So there's a lot of back and forth collaboration between all the groups, which is very evident in how well um, we're able to communicate and just how things run over here is very smoothly. Everyone knows each other and there's just overall great communication. Um, now, as a research group, we don't always get to do as much of the outreach as we would like to, which is why I really wanted to highlight some of the work done by these volunteer groups. So the St. Joseph Peninsula Turtle Patrol is under the umbrella of the Florida Coastal Conservancy. And this nonprofit and as well as running one of the volunteer groups, also runs a sea turtle center in Port St. Joe, which is in Gulf County, which is an open center. They're open a few days a week and allows people to come in, talk, learn about sea turtles all year round, and really get that front face-to-face -face communication with members of the community, as well as tourists and people visiting our area. They also put on once a year, the Forgotten Coast Sea Turtle Festival, which they've been doing since 2016. 
And this festival is a great outreach opportunity. Ourselves, as well as the other groups in the area are able to attend this event. And it's a great way, again, to get that public face-to-face -face knowledge out to the people and really share what all of our groups are doing on um, the ground level throughout the county. So with everything that we have going on, just like in most places, we do unfortunately have our challenges. So one of the big, some of the big ones are holes. And, you know, you see this a lot, people talk about it. People are digging these holes on the beach, they're having a fun time, but then they leave them at night. And you can see a picture of me standing here uh, in the red light. I'm in a hole that's about knee deep and definitely could fit an adult turtle, could get stuck in there. So, you know, we'll sometimes spend some of our nights out filling in holes, unfortunately. Um, we do find a lot of debris, trash that washes up on the beach. Um, we, this trunk of buoys is one that we've collected over the course of a season up at the state park. Uh, this isn't even all of them. We had too many <laughs> to keep track of. And, you know, we'll have anything from people leaving beach chairs on the beach at night. It's really common here in Gulf County for people to leave umbrellas, beach chairs, coolers, um, you name it, on the beach overnight, just so they don't have to lug it back and forth every day. Um, remnants of fires are a big one, too. People will leave firewood out on the beach. Sometimes they'll leave lit fires on the beach. So this is one of the challenges of you know, keeping the beach clean, keeping it, you know, uh, away from having holes and possible deterrence from nesting, as well as things like fires are one, one of many forms of artificial light that we have to deal with out on the beach that can really deter the females or even the hatchlings. I've unfortunately had many stories of some very close encounters between adult turtles and hatchlings with fires. Thankfully, no bad story, like, no bad stories, but it is something that we think and talk about all the time. Lights is another issue. I have two pictures here. Both of these pictures are actually taken with um, just your regular phone's night mode. Technology has gotten so great nowadays, but you can see in both of these pictures, house lights. This one on the right is pretty much on the beach from erosion. And you can see this turtle that's crawling up the beach, kind of hard to see close to that but you can see all the carport lights are on. We have house lights, outside porch lights. Same thing with this other turtle that was nesting. She's in the process of nesting right here. You get these bright lights on some of these houses. And thankfully in both of these nights, I was able to get such good pictures with the iPhone camera because we had a full moon, which usually deters some of the effects of the house lights. But especially on nights where it's new moon and you don't have that natural light, light source, we do see uh, disorientation events with the nesting females as well as the hatchlings. In addition, um, Gulf County actually also allows beach driving. And this is more or less, um, the county is good about monitoring the beaches. People are not allowed to drive on most of the county's beaches at night, thankfully, and this is the time when the nesting females are coming up to lay their eggs, as well as the time that the hatchlings are trying to make it to the water. So these really integral times, thankfully, vehicles aren't on the beach, but we do get close calls of people driving too close to the nests, potentially hitting nests, and when I say hitting nests, knocking over their stakes with their cars, not necessarily directly impacting the egg chamber, but it is possible. So this is just one of those that we, um, we watch and keep an eye on. It is something that's been going on in Gulf County for decades now, so it's not anything new. But all of the problems and challenges that I have mentioned so far really have become, I don't want to say, they've become exacerbated, I would say, in the, in the past few years, especially as more and more tensions come to the area more people are interested in coming over to the Forgotten Coast, seeing the beautiful beaches. And one of the consequences of that is, you know, more fires, more trash left on the beach, more people driving. So lots of challenges there. Interesting to see how that develops over the next couple of years, especially as we see more and more people coming to the area. 
to live and to visit on vacation. But I don't want it to sound all doom and gloom. There is a lot of help on the side of the county that is from the Gulf County and from the Gulf County Sheriff's Office. So on the Gulf County side, their tourism page is really good at promoting safe practices on the beach. And there is a leave no trace ordinance in effect for Gulf County. So there are in things implemented to make sure people aren't leaving beach chairs, umbrellas, all that out on the beach, as well as direct communication through social media from the county to really promote keeping the beaches clean and safe for, you know, not just the wildlife, but humans as well. You know, a lot of these things like safe beach driving, filling in your holes, not leaving fires. These are all things that don't just benefit uh, the animals, but also benefit people. We've also have a great relationship with the Gulf County Sheriff's Office. They're really big in enforcement, and especially when it comes to making sure people aren't driving on the beach at night, making sure the gates that keep people off the beach at night are closed. And um, on the few occasions where we've actually had to call them, respond quickly to any issues that we're having with people and sea turtles. So I didn't wanna end my presentation on a sad note, but there is a lot of good stuff coming from the county. And I think it's just one of those growing pains of dealing with the increased presence of people and really learning to have that good balance between people and animals. So with that, um, I know we're holding questions to the end, but I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation and I look forward to talking to you all later on. Thank you, Dan, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, next, we'll hear from Janice Becker. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, some of this might be a little repetitive of what Dan spoke on. Um, a lot of the work that we do is very similar, but hopefully it won't be too repetitive. Again, thank you for joining us. Just wanted to start off with um, Anner's mission statement. Uh, you can read through it. I work for the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve as a volunteer coordinator. And a big part of my role there is being the sea turtle program coordinator. Here's just a little rundown of my background. Um, I've known as the turtle girl here in Franklin County, one of several. Um, I've been with Anner since 2014 when I volunteered. Um, what, and completed an internship for a couple of years. So this is my uh, eighth year being within the program and I've just completed my sixth year of coordinating. And there's a few titles um, underneath that volunteer coordinator umbrella. Um, one of them is being the Marine Turtle Permit Holder for St. George Island. So just a brief outline, um, I'll talk briefly about Franklin County sea turtles um, and then the work that we do with doing beach surveys and then ways that you can help, which really ties into um, the conservation easements that will be discussed later on. So there's seven different species of sea turtles, uh, six are listed on the threatened um, endangered species list. There might be all seven on there at this point. The one that we don't have too much information on is the flatback turtle, which is at the bottom of the screen. That one's native to Australia, but the five sea turtles that are common to Florida are all on the endangered species list. Just briefly go through the ones that we see up here in North Florida, uh, the loggerhead sea turtle. Um, that one is definitely our main nester in this area and the Florida Panhandle is home to a distinct subpopulation, which just means that the turtles are more closely uh, related compared to the rest of the state. Then we have the green sea turtle. Um, this slide actually says that they nest every other year, but thankfully they've nested um, consecutively through 
uh, the past three years. So that's really exciting. And like Dan mentioned, the juveniles stay in this area. They like to hang out over there in Gulf County. Um, they are the vegetarians of the sea. We call them the lawnmowers <laughs> of the sea. They like all of those seabed grasses. We also sometimes see a leatherback sea turtle in this area nesting. Um, she's a, a rare nester for us. Uh, they are the largest sea turtle species. This is um, the one that has nested on St. George Island in years um, past. The last time that we saw her was in 2014, my internship year. And then the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle is the most critically endangered sea turtle. They typically don't nest in this area. Um, there was one confirmed nest in Alligator Point a few years back, which was really exciting. Um, for the most part, when I see these sea turtles, they've accidentally been caught by fishermen and need to go to rehab. So they tend to hang out around the piers um, in Franklin County. These are the nesting beach areas in um, Franklin County. You can see in the middle, the St. George Island. Um, I'm the permit holder for um, the state park line all the way down to what's called Bob Sykes Cut. And so the nesting season is every year, May through October. Um, the nesting females come ashore three to five times a season, um, but not every year. The green sea turtles nest every other year while loggerheads um, nest every two to three years. And we use the tracks, um, that's what we're looking for when we're out on the beach early in the morning um, to determine what type of species crawl. So these are the three crawls of um, what we can possibly see on our beach. Uh, the leatherback sea turtle and the green sea turtles, they have a simultaneous gait. And so you can see kind of slash marks with their crawls while the loggerhead um, has a crawl like a, a baby crawls so every other flipper mark and they do those commas. So like Dan mentioned, um, they typically nest at night. Um, after we've identified what species crawled, we look to see whether she false crawled, which is what's shown in the top picture. That's a very typical false crawl where she's come up and done a U-turn and gone right back to the Gulf. And of course, the other option is for um, the nesting female to lay eggs, and loggerheads typically lay around 80 to 120. So, try to see if this video will work. Um, that's a loggerhead covering up her egg clutch. So they take a good bit of time um, packing the sand down on their clutch, and then. Um, the picture shows how she's uh, spraying sand everywhere. She's using those front flippers then um, to disguise the nest and, and put a lot of sand over it. And so with the hatchling season, um, about 50 to 65 days after the nest was laid, we start looking for signs of hatching. And again, like Dan mentioned, they usually hatch at night. One key thing that I always like to mention, it's fun, um, the incubation temperature of the nest determines uh, whether the hatchlings will be male or female. So we like to say hot chicks or cool dudes. So <laughs> the warmer the sand temperature, the more female hatchlings you'll have, the cooler the sand temperature, the more males you'll have. And like Dan mentioned too, the trek to the water is not easy. Um, they have to deal with predators, lights, and sometimes obstacles. This is our little all moment, <laughs> watching this little baby hatchling. So you can see it, it has a little trouble getting over that shell. And so if they have to navigate all of this beach gear, you know, that can be a problem. Um, and this one, unfortunately, was caught up and um, it was located during nesting surveys in the morning and it, it was deceased. 
So where do the hatchlings go after they leave our beach? Um, they head out to the Sargasm Sea um, and spend several years there um, eating and getting stronger. Um, it is estimated that only one in 1,000 hatchlings reach reproductive age. I've even heard it's more of like one in 10,000 hatchlings make it to adulthood. This is our 26th year um, doing the nesting surveys on St. George Island. And so I have a group of volunteers and usually have two interns as well. Um, we're walking the beach from May through October and we're looking for um, you know, new sea turtle activity, looking for those crawls and also signs of hatching. Um, we're monitoring the nest daily for signs of predation and also for any um, signs of like overwash from the tide or storm surge um, impacts. Along with the research that we do, which is accomplished under Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Dr. Mariana Fuentes with FSU is also conducting uh, several research projects um, each summer. Uh, that work began in 2016. And my coworker, Megan Lamb, is also currently doing a nest temperature study. Uh, she started on Little St. George Island in 2016 as well. Um, and then she started on St. George Island with this study last year. So in Florida, FWC has a network of these volunteer groups and state parks and other organizations that monitor the nest. Um, this was a training activity. So you see Harvey in the back is getting the uh, crawl width measurement. Uh, Jeff is digging for the clutch, the very top of the clutch, so we know how to um, place the screen over it. Uh, Tara is getting the GPS coordinates, and then I like to say Mary's observing everyone. <laughs> She's taking a break because she had just um, located a clutch previous to this one. I always want to give a huge shout out to our volunteers. Um, the area that I'm permitted over is just over 10 miles of beach, and I absolutely could not do all of the work that this entails on my own. So very thankful for our volunteers and all of the hard work and passion um, and dedication that they have. Just some recent nest numbers last year, uh, we had 250 loggerhead nests and nine green sea turtle nests, which again, that was the first even year that uh, green nests have been recorded. So it was very exciting. One thing though, and um, it's already been mentioned is disorientations can be a problem. Last year we had 35 nests that were disoriented. And then this year has also been what we would call a typical nesting season. Uh, typical would be around 200 to 250 loggerhead nests. Um, we've had seasons of up to 465 loggerhead nests documented. Um, and then we've also had 22 green nests this year. So like I mentioned, predators can be a problem. So this is one difference in what was already discussed in that we um, screen each one of our nests. Um, and that's a device that helps keep predators out. Coyotes are a problem on St. George Island. And so that is why we screen them all. By doing that, that also means that we evaluate every nest that we screen. So at that 50 day mark, again, we're looking for signs of hatching, which is um, the hatchling tracks. And there can also be a dip within the nest if the, the nest has hatched. And then with determining hatch success, um, again, we're monitoring the nest the entire season. And um, if we see signs of hatching, we evaluate approximately 72 hours later. If we never see signs of hatching, we evaluate it on the 70th day after it was laid. And we count um, the hatched eggs, the unhatched eggs. Um, and there's some other things as well. If they um, still have some straggler hatchlings in the clutch, that's the fun part of the work that we do. And um, also there can be different, there's pipped, eggs that can be live 
and also deceased. And all of this information is used to look at long-term population trends, um, which informs policy decisions. So this ties right into um, the conservation easements that will be discussed. The restrictions that are listed in the conservation easements directly benefit sea turtles by reducing threats. And artificial lighting is um, one of the biggest problems on our island. This picture is of a successful hatch. This is what we love to see with all of the hatchling tracks going towards the Gulf. So we like to say after nine, it's turtle time. And we ask um, locals and um, everyone who's visiting and staying at a beachfront property and even in the first and second tier to please close their curtains and blinds um, by 9 p.m. and also turn off exterior lights if they're not needed. This is a hatchling that was released um, with using the proper sea turtle friendly flashlight, which is the red LED or amber LED. And that is one of the restricted uses within uh, the conservation easement in regard to artificial lighting. Um, it can cause disorientations and it can also cause um, nesting deterrence. So the nesting females are looking for a dark, quiet spot on the beach to lay their eggs. So light can scare them off, while with the hatchlings, they're actually drawn towards the light. So if you know that house that's lit up, it's brighter than the ambient light over the gulf, then they think that that's the correct way to go is towards the house. Um, another restricted use has to do with vegetation removal. Um, and that is when, you know, the vegetation is taken out, those, um, you can see the vegetation there. If that was removed, even more of the light would be visible to the beach. We've seen this happen um, due to Hurricane Michael. A lot of the vegetation was ripped out and removed. And so more lights then were visible on the beach because the dune structure was really, um, destroyed due to that storm. But if you have that vegetation up, it blocks the light. And um, so that works right along with the disorientation and also just habitat degradation. You want to um, have those good strong dune system with the vegetation. This is an example of um, a disoriented loggerhead. Um, so it's not always the hatchlings that can be disoriented, but also the nesting females. Um, the pictures aren't too great, but you can see that she is in um, the road there. And then she was also doing uh, figure eights within the median when my intern located her. Um, and she had a really long way to go back. You can see on the side picture, um, we had to get her turned back around toward the Gulf. And this is a happy story where, you know, thankfully we located her and were able to help her get back to the Gulf, um, you know, there's also sad stories I'm sure that you've seen where um, there's not a happy ending to a situation like this. And so that's why it's so important for um, houses to have the correct exterior lighting and also um, have the tinting on the windows um, and also turn off the, the interior lights or pull the curtains and shades at night. That top picture shows what um, hatchling disorientation looks like. You see all the little loop-de-loos. That is indicating that the hatchlings don't know what direction to go in. Um, and this is a list of you know, many of the problems that sea turtles face. And a lot of it is human introduced. So one of our big pushes is balloons and plastic bags. Um, Leatherback sea turtles, particularly, their main diet is jellyfish, and sea turtles can't tell the difference um, whether or not it's a balloon or a plastic bag or a jellyfish. And so if they eat that plastic, it can become impacted within their system, and um, they'll eventually 
if they don't receive help, they'll die. So again, these are the ways that we ask homeowners and our tourists to help. And other ways that you can help um, by purchasing the Florida sea turtle tag, um, that goes directly into sea turtle conservation research. And they, um, FWC also sells these uh, bumper stickers annually um, that help support the research. And we have an adopt in us program um, at Anner where you're able to um, support the work that we do and support our interns and just um, the basic needs of our program. And um, by sponsoring in us, you receive a personalized certificate and also a map link, which shows you all of the nest locations on the island. And um, then I send out a season summary at the end to um, let everyone know how successful the season was. And please feel free to follow our Facebook page. I do my best to keep it updated often. And um, questions will be at the end of the talk and that's all that I have. Thank you again for joining us. Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you to Dan and Janice for their presentations about their sea turtle conservation work in um, the Panhandle area, uh, the St. George and St. Joe area. And I'm here to talk about coastal conservation easements, which are a land uh, conservation's approach to protecting sea turtle nesting habitat on private property. Um, so let's get into it. So for some context, as we've discussed, um, Florida contains the majority of sea turtle nesting habitat for the country. And as Dan's map showed, even, uh, even uh, nesting turtles that may nest in our, on our coasts are also going uh, away from our coasts and, and traveling far distances. So our nesting habitat is super important for conservation and sea turtle populations. Um, and most of the coastal conservation work and programs are taking place on public property and public lands. Um, so though those, uh, though those programs are really in, uh, impactful for conservation, we want to try and do as much conservation as we can on private property as well to fill in those gaps and, um, and amplify our conservation efforts. So as discussed by Dan and Janice, there are lots of different threats to sea turtle uh, populations like artificial lighting, erosion, beach furniture that is uh, impeding their nesting um, paths. Uh, and then predation, pollution, coastal armoring. So a little bit of foundation and background on property rights that then will go into easements, um, which is that we like to use this, um, this example of uh, our property rights being a bundle, of, a bundle of sticks. And so each individual stick is a property right that you may have as a property owner. So you may have a stick that is the possession of your property, the stick that is the right to mortgage your property, sell, uh, subdivide, develop, sell mineral rights to your property. And so um, what easements do is they take one or two of the sticks and they restrict those rights uh, from the property owner in order to do conservation on a property while uh, the owner of the property still maintains the majority of the bundle. So, Again, a little more specifics on conservation easements. They are a voluntary agreement between landowner and the easement holder to restrict certain uses of the property for the purposes of conservation. So these easements, these conservation, coastal conservation easements are not access easements or right away easements. So they are not providing um, access to your, your private property um, and they can be either donated or sold to the easement holder and these easement holders can be both governmental or NGOs like Electrical Conservation Trust can hold easements and the, uh, of the, the objective of easement holders is to make sure that these restrictions that you put on your property on the conservation easement is, are being followed and there aren't any breakings or um, in what is being restricted. 
And so what can you restrict? I mean, it's basically limitless, but often there is a conversation between landowner and easement holder um, on what, what uh, plans you have for the property and what rights you would like to, to, to limit. So limiting development or, or limiting um, different types of actions on your property um, can be um, discussed and put into the easement. And once the easement is adopted, it will then be, uh, it will be up to the easement holder to make sure that those uh, easement guidelines are being followed. And the cool thing about conservation easements is the fact that these easements are, uh, they're perpetual. So even if the, the uh, land and the property changes hands, um, is sold, that conservation value and those restrictions will be, uh, they follow the property, they follow the deed. And so that conservation benefit will be uh, amplified into the future. So traditionally conservation easements are large swaths of land um, that are connecting public lands. Um, they're often used to uh, for like wildlife corridors and um, they're big and connected parcels of land. And that's a little different than coastal properties because our coastal properties are often smaller and they're often also developed already. So traditional easements often look for undeveloped land, wild places. And uh, we have worked with uh, the University of Florida's law school, as well as a sea turtle conservancy and the Archie Carr Center for Sea Turtle Research to develop a, a program and a, and a document, which is the Coastal Conservation Easement that will work for these non-traditional parcels. So the small, the, the differences often are that the, these parcels are, value, are, very, are highly valuable and are often already developed. So that is, a, is, is the main distinction between um, the traditional easement and a coastal conservation easement. Um, and that will go into the ways that rights are restricted in the conservation value. So here is some of the restricted, uh, potential restricted uses under our, conservation, our coastal conservation easements. And um, as you can see, some of these things um, have been discussed um, by Janice and Dan as being threats to our, our sea turtle nesting habitats. And so they have, we developed these, these, these restrictions with um, Sea Turtle Conservancy so that we were doing the most and the restrictions were um, amplifying the most habitat benefit for sea turtles. And it's not, it's also other uh, shore uh, nesting species. So shore nesting birds are also benefiting but we wanted to make sure that the restrictions that we were doing on these coastal properties, because they are um, usually already developed, are, um, are doing the most benefit for the habitats. So things like, uh, like restricting dumping, restricting vegetation removal on dunes, um, uh, restricting sea turtle unfriendly lighting, restricting people from driving on the beach. So, so say like a municipality doesn't uh, let uh, driving on the beach at certain times, um, if you are also, you can also make sure that, that people cannot drive on, your, on their sections of the beach as well. So restricting these different um, uses are going to benefit sea turtle, um, sea turtle habitats, but the easements, again, are very adaptable to what you would like to do on your property and your plans for your property. So this is a long list and it, you could restrict everything on this list and you can also pick and choose what you would like to restrict um, and put into the easement. And so that is a conversation between, um, between us uh, as a land trust and Alachua Conservation Trust and you as the, the property owner to make sure that this document is, uh, is doing conservation while also um, allowing you to use your property in the ways that you wish. So a couple points on um, the specifics of a coastal conservation easement. Um, the first point I'm gonna make is about the valuation of an easement. The valuation of an easement, a coastal conservation easement is more difficult than a traditional one because often the valuation is done, it's done by an appraiser and they often use, the, the conservation value is, is um, often taken from the ability, the value of developing that property. So with traditional easements, if it's like a large area of land, a, a large parcel that is undeveloped, the conservation value of that easement is determined by the value that it would gain if it was developed. So 
these since these coastal conservation easements are often done on properties that are already developed, it is sometimes harder for uh, for a property appraisers to value the conservation value of the property, which then in turn makes it a little bit more difficult to get uh, some of the tax incentives that are traditionally associated with an easement. Another thing to mention is that mortgage properties are properties that we cannot place easements on. And so um, if if your if your house, if you have a house on a uh, on, on a property and you would like to do an easement, that, that mortgage would have to be paid off prior to placing an easement on it. And then just to note landowner attitudes, um, that is, is pointing to that we have found that uh, uh, the main motivation for doing a coastal conservation easement um, of this type is often, it, it has to be mostly rooted in pure motivation of sea turtle con conservation. This is, um, this is an easement that is, is aimed to benefit the species. And um, because of these valuation uh, issues and, um, and the, the, the much smaller nature and developed nature of these properties, it's often hard to get that tax incentive. Um, so uh, it, it really has to come from a place of wanting to do sea turtle conservation. And one of the really special things about these coastal conservation easements is the fact that they're perpetual. So um, if, we, I mean, if, if we have a, I mean, we've all seen that like political will can change and, and uh, restrictions can change uh, depending on who is in charge of our governmental systems. And so uh, the cool thing about these easements is that um, whether or not uh, restrictions are lessened or increased uh, for sea turtle conservation, the, pro the restrictions that you put on your property through an easement carries through um, to the future, uh, whether or not um, those restrictions are across the board for all property owners. So this is a, a slide about the tax incentives. And um, so if your easement is restrictive enough that it can pass IRS muster um, and the IRS deems the conservation value um, high enough, then it is, it is something that you can write off um, on, your, on your tax, your federal income tax, um, you can get 50% uh, income tax deduction uh, the first year of the donation, and then that's a 15-year carry-forward period. Um, so again, if if the if you if the the easement is strong enough in the, the eyes of the IRS, and that's something that you can apply for, then you would also be able to get a tax deduction if you donated an easement. So along with our coastal conservation easements, we also worked with the Sea Turtle Conservancy and our other partners to develop beach management agreements, which we kind of like to think of as a coastal conservation easement light. So these are, they include a lot of those same restricted uses like conservation easements, but they are not perpetual. They're five-year, uh, often five-year contracts um, that um, are, are still working to do those same restrictions, but um, they they do end, and so this uh, this also has a stewardship component, which is a really special. And so the stewardship component is 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 they require a management plan that can help you do uh, and understand restoration on your property to make sure that your property is um, the best habitat for for nesting sea turtles as it can be. And they work um, very well. Uh, they are designed to work um, with neighbor like neighborhoods and adjacent parcels. So if there's a strong will within a community uh, on, a, on a section of the coastline to do this type of conservation on your property, then something like a beach management agreement is a great way to get that started. And, um, and we've had a lot of success in uh, the Keys on Long Beach, um, where we have had a lot of beach management agreements on adjacent properties. And that just amplifies the, uh, the conservation efforts of the area and, and just more intact uh, coastline that is um, safe and, and for these sea turtles nesting. And the other um, tool that we have in our toolbox are sea turtle lighting easements. These easements are solely focused on uh, sea turtle friendly lighting. So like Janice spoke about and Dan spoke about, um, the lighting is a huge uh, issue for sea, sea turtles and can, can cause disorientation. 
So these easements are narrowly focused on, on making sure that properties have restrictions on sea turtle unfriendly lighting in perpetuity. So like a coastal conservation easement, these sea turtle lighting easements are perpetual. And if the land and the parcel passes on to a different owner, these restrictions are still um, in place. They follow the deed. So this often works well with um, other, other like retrofitting lighting programs. So I know the Sea Turtle Conservancy has a retrofit lighting program. And so they work to make sure that your property's lighting is sea turtle friendly. And then to further solidify that sea turtle friendly lighting, you can place an easement on your, sea tur your, your property so that that lighting continues on that property and that's that part of the coast continues to be a haven for uh, nesting turtles. And uh, one thing to note though is since this is one, a very narrow restricted use um, at, for an easement, it is very unlikely to get those tax benefits um, because the IRS is, is, is not going to see that conservation value with such a narrow uh, one type of restriction. So that was a very brief overview of um, these tools. And again, these things are uh, these these documents and these these programs are highly adaptable to your property and your um, and what you and what you want to do for uh, both turtles and yourself and your families and your land. So um, just to reiterate, the coastal conservation easements are protecting those properties and restricting those those specific um, activities that are. Uh, unsafe for sea turtles, and that protects the property in perpetuity. So again, this is going to, even if you sell your land or it is inherited down the line, um, this, these, these easements and these protections and these restrictions stay with the land. Um, and then for beach management agreements, it's a, a similar protections and a similar set of restrictions along with the stewardship component. Um, but that's only for a smaller period of time. And, and we hope that with beach management agreements, we can also move those into coastal conservation easements as uh, we would like to protect properties and sea turtles uh, for as long as possible. And then again, uh, lastly, the sea turtle lighting easements are these narrow focus lighting um, easements. So they're only focused on lighting issues and making sure that uh, the property has sea turtle friendly lighting in perpetuity as well. So thank you for listening to me and um, I am ready to take questions as well as I think we will bring Dan and Janice back to do a Q&A section. Yeah, hi everybody. Thank you to all of our speakers for presenting and we'll now be moving into the Q&A portion of our evening. So remember that you could ask questions through the chat or through the Q&A box at the bottom of our screen. So with that all being said, let's get into the first question. It reads, and I think this is actually for you, Emma, how did ACT first become involved in coastal habitat protection? So in 2015, we started working with the Archie Carr Center, uh, Center for Sea Turtle Conservation and NIFWIF to, do, to develop a tool along with University of Florida's uh, law school and we developed, we were, we were trying to find a creative solution to do sea turtle conservation um, in, a, in a way that is similar to the work that we do in um, non-coastal properties. So as a land trust, we do these conservation, these traditional conservation easements um, inland uh, more often. And so we wanted to try and find a way to uh, do the work that we, that we do traditionally on the coasts. So we work, we've been working with them and we have continued to work with those organizations to develop these coastal conservation easements and then um, do outreach to try and, and to try and find creative ways to do sea turtle conservation um, as part of our work. Great answer. And I think our second question could go for all of our panelists and it reads, do you guys have a primary call to action that you'd like your audiences to take home with them after ending this webinar? I'll go first. I mean, I guess multiple people can answer this. Uh, one of the things that I always feel is good is we really need a balance. I think a lot of people will get um, turned off or scared if conservation groups come in and they're 
immediately like take everything away and you know same goes for vice versa when members of the public don't want to take an extra step to help the wildlife so i think it's important that we find that balance in how we can help the wildlife as well as still you know as people do the things that we enjoy and utilize the same resources that we try to share with the wildlife One of our main messages that we try to get across is just really simple and we say clean, dark and flat. And that's a message that we would like for homeowners um, to pass along to the people who are you know, visiting our island and staying in their homes um, during the tourist season and the sea turtle nesting season. And you know, clean, dark and flat just means please leave the, the beach clean. Um, like Dan mentioned, uh, bringing up all of the uh, trash and your um, beach gear from the day and leaving the beach clean for uh, the nesting females and the hatchlings and then dark is that lighting aspect that we've all talked about um clean dark and flat and then you know he mentioned also these huge holes are a problem in franklin county as well so being sure that you knock down sand castles and fill in those holes by the end of the day And then for us and these programs and these tools that we're trying to um, get really rooted on our coastlines, I think just uh, even if you're kind of on the fence or you're not sure if a coastal conservation easement is something that you uh, want to do or you're, you're just, you just want to learn more, reaching out and, and starting that conversation and starting that dialogue and figuring out what you may be able to do for your property um, to protect sea turtle, uh, sea turtle habitat um, it's, it's the best way to, is the best way to make the first step. Great answers from all of you. And our next question, it looks like it's for Janice and it is some of the nests that you described during your presentation were screened and some were not screened. So are there any pros or cons in regards to that screening? Um, for the most part, we do our best to screen every nest. Sometimes we're not able to locate the very top of the clutch. Um, in those situations, we won't use a screen and we'll rope off the entire disturbed area. Um, as far as the pros, it definitely deters coyotes from getting to the clutch. Some of them are sneaky and will tunnel in to the side, um, but you know, screening them all definitely deters that. Thankfully, um, knock on wood, <laughs> this season we actually didn't have any coyote problems. Um, but in previous years, it just depends on what's going on. Um, I know with Little St. George Island, they still have some predation this year. And so that's the reason that we screen all of the nests that um, we possibly can. Sometimes we miss nests. We um, are on the beach uh, every day, May through October. Um, typically around late September um, or even early September, the nesting females have moved on. And so we're able to spot check nests, but um, we are on the beach. Our last eval is, is scheduled for October 31st. So <laughs> right on schedule, but um, you know, we have these storm events and sometimes weather can either delay our surveys or cause us to not be on the beach. And so um, wind and rain can, eliminate uh, both the nesting female tracks and also the hatchling tracks. And so um, sometimes we miss nests and then ghost crabs or coyotes will discover that nest for us. Um, and then that nest will be screened um, if it's the proper time to do so. So um, I know there's ongoing research on whether or not um, the screens mess with the, the hatchlings and the um, magnetic field. As far as we can understand, um, the hatchlings, the females tend to return to the general area where they were hatched to lay their nest um, you know, over 20 years later. And so um, there is some thought that possibly having the screen might mess up um, their magnetic field, but that's just ongoing research. There's so much to learn about sea turtles. Um, you know, there's always more to learn. And I also wanted to mention, if you are in this area, June through August, we offer a turtle talk weekly at the Nature Center where I'm able to go into more depth on um, sea turtles, the work that we do in ways that you can help. 
And so that's June through August um, each year at the Nature Center at Anner. Thank you, Janice. And uh, we have another question, and it I think is believe I believe it's for Emma, and it is what sh why should I do a conservation easement if my county or city already has strong coastal protection statute statutes? So, um, like I I, I kind of discussed this, but it's good to reiterate um, uh, these uh, the political will and restrictions um, in a county are subject to change as different people come into power and different um, different sways in society um, uh, are are putting um, different issues into the into the forefront. So um, the the best thing about a coastal conservation easement and a lighting easement is the fact that they are in perpetuity. So doing these easements um, where the restrictions and the protections that you are putting into the easement and putting onto the property stay on the property are it that that's one of the most sol solid ways that you can protect your property and protect the habitat on that property um, into the future. So that is why those coastal conservation easements are uh, stronger protection. Thank you. And the next question is also for you. And it says, Emma, could you provide more info about the incentivized tax benefits involving vegetation planting dune building and beach trash collection, for example, in a large homeowner's community situated 10 miles of a barrier island nesting beach. How would the HOA and its members submit a request to benefit from reduction in taxes? I'm actually going to kick that one to Erica Hernandez. Hi, um, so that is a really interesting question. A lot of the kind of activities that are described in that question related to vegetation planting, dune building, beach trash collection, uh, collectively is really important for sea turtle habitat. And that really kind of gets at the idea of the beach management agreement, which is a collective agreement meant to really benefit multiple homeowners collaborating, working together. It's uh, time limited. It has a lot of construction that's related to the language you would see in a conservation easement but it's not perpetual, it's not permanent. And so really the benefit to that as a tool is really about gaining momentum and interest in working together that maybe potentially homeowners could see a path to doing a permanent conservation easement. So for those types of activities, there's not really a tax write-off like you might have with a conservation easement. Now, if you are contributing to, um, some type of nonprofit activity, perhaps you can claim that on your income taxes. Um, so there's that potential there. Uh, but really what Emma was speaking towards, the tax incentives are really based on the value of the conservation easement, which is really a separate, a separate thing that could be related. Um, one thing that Electoral Conservation Trust does is that we do help facilitate program opportunities when there's interest. So if we were able to engage with a homeowners association and had a lot of energy and interest behind doing some sort of project like this, then we could start reaching out to some of our partners that have funding availability. So we work with other agencies, other nonprofits, other research institutions uh, that do have funding opportunities that can help collaborate and have a greater impact and leverage those funds to do things that homeowners and homeowners associations want to do. And so we have some examples of that in the Florida Keys where we've been able to essentially find matching funds with a local nonprofit called Save a Turtle down in, in Big Pine Key, along with private homeowners that were also interested in investing a little bit of their own personal money. And all together, we have this really fantastic project where a bunch of beach that was impacted by hurricane, it's one of the only sandy beaches down in the Keys, has now... Uh, restored habitat and is having nesting sea turtles there right now. So I think really the idea is if there's interest, come talk to us and we can figure out if there's a way to, to work together and, and do something on private property. Thank you, Erica. And we have one more question. It's what happens to these easements as Florida's coasts change over the coming decades? 
So these um, these easements are put on the property perpetually, and so they stay with the property. As long as these properties exist, um, then the easement is on it and um, the easement holder, it will be monitoring um, the restrictions of the easement. So that's, I mean, that's really basically the answer. As long as, as long as that coast, that coastline, I mean, is above water, then, then that easement is, is, is on there and we will be protecting it in, in cases of uh, natural disasters and, and, uh, and different um, events that may affect the shoreline. Um, we may see a decline in shoreline or a difference in changing in the shoreline, but um, as the shoreline returns and as uh, the property ma is maintained, then we will continue to have that easement on that property. Thank you. And it looks like that was it. Are there any more questions that anybody would like to share in the chat or put in the Q&A before we close things up? Last call. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's presentations. And thank you to Jan and sorry, to Dan and Janice again for being our guest speakers tonight. Next month's webinar will be a discussion of the new book, The Wilder Heart of Florida with editors and authors from the collection. Join us on November 18th for that presentation. Thank you all and good night, you guys. <laughs>